Merry Christmas. We're on. Hey, we begin our Christmas series today. Very excited about Christmas, as you well know. We celebrate it throughout the entire year because Jesus Christ is Lord 365 days out of the year. People might think that's strange, but listen, when we come to this Christmas series, we want to look at the full message of Christmas. What do I mean the full message? I don't know about you, but I listen to Christmas music pretty much year-round. You know, I just enjoy it. It makes me happy. There's times when you feel a little tired, a little depressed. You just pop on some Christmas music, and you know what? <laughs> it just helps. It really does. And I enjoy the trappings of Christmas, if you will. Nothing wrong with that. Obviously, raccoons playing in the snow and, you know, all the funny little shows and movies and the kids. It's a lot of fun to watch their eyes and to see how this time of the year really touches them and builds memories. Hey, that's great. But if that's all we had for Christmas... If that's all there was to Christmas, then it might as well be Halloween or any other worthless holiday, quite frankly, because it has no meaning other than party time. So today we begin a series to look at the greater depth and meaning of Christmas. And I caution you, and I, as I caution myself this week, at first it comes across incredibly depressing. And the reason being is Christmas exists for a real reason, not just for fun, but there's something that happens when the Christ of Christmas comes. So let's take a look at it together. We're going to begin in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to look at the first two verses. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 through 2. Let's prepare our hearts to receive what God has to say through His Word. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to open up your word. Thank you for the opportunity to study this all week long and look at connections and connections from the world to your word, the word to your world. Lord, help us. Help us. And Lord, I know you already have. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's go to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 2. In this passage of Scripture, in these first two verses, are recorded one of the most profound prophecies of God's plan. In fact, it's so profound that Matthew picks it up in his gospel. And so let's take a look at what Isaiah writes. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1 begins in a very interesting way with a transition word. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future... He will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. An immense amount of meaning packed in two very short verses. Let's unpack them together, shall we? First of all, Isaiah is writing to a people that are preparing to face some very dark days. Distress had already come upon the people of God. They had rejected God's instructions. They had rebelled against His commands. They had mixed and mingled with wrong ideas and thoughts. They had allowed the world to begin to shape them. And they had missed the reality of what God was doing in the world. The people were walking in darkness. The background. Okay, so Isaiah is writing this section of Scripture. He writes these words in a present tense even though a lot of what he's saying is future tense. The dark clouds were already beginning to form over Israel. If you know your history, Israel was conquered by outside foreigners. And if you know your biblical history, that was on purpose. You'll see that God has funny ways of shaping His people and unfolding His plan. With or without us, Jesus Christ will rescue those who desire to be rescued by Him. With or without us, God's plan will unfold. So Isaiah's writing while Israel's facing impending doom. Israel's facing dark days ahead. They were filled with despair. They knew that God's judgment was coming, but more than that, just the judgment of darkness itself. The way that people were treating each other. The way they were living. The violence and the other elements that were happening. And there was great fear. In fact, this, this area that he's talking about, uh, Zebulun and Naphtali, these are the two most northern tribes of Israel. I won't give you a geography lesson, but you've heard of Galilee, right? The man from Galilee. Any Johnny Cash fans out there? The man from Galilee. This, this region that was so humbled and so filled with darkness became a brilliant place of light. Fascinating. So, of course, these two northern tribes were the first to suffer and fall during the Assyrian invasion, 
when they were humbled and they were shamed by defeat. God had said judgment would come upon them, and it did through a very unusual way. The Assyrians swept across the land beginning about 732, 730 BC until ultimately in 722 the entire northern kingdom falls. In another invasion later, the southern kingdom will fall just as God said it would. So it's fascinating. It looks as if God's plans are over, his people are defeated, it's all over. It's end. That's it, right? Game over. Well, God had a plan and he had a purpose. So Galilee of the Gentiles... First of all, this is that northern region that Jesus grew up in. Remember Nazareth? Galilee of the Gentiles. The name Gentile really just means non-Jewish person. It had begun to mean in the scriptures unbeliever as well. Gentile was not just someone who was non-Jewish. It had become and is used metaphorically as well to mean anyone who's not following or obeying God. So this region was obviously disdained. This was a region that uh, people looked down upon. Do you, do you remember Nathaniel when he was called to meet Jesus and he's like, yeah, we found the Messiah. He's from Nazareth. And Nathaniel nearly spits up on himself. Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? What are you, crazy, right? All of a sudden there's this really strange idea that anything up there, that's just pagan land. Disdained land. Unbelievers and foreigners were overwhelming the land. Violence and despair, darkness, sexual immorality, sin, all these things were happening. How could the Messiah come from such a dark, dark place? A surprising choice by God, don't you think? You would think that he would just open up in Jerusalem with the birth of Christ, stay in Jerusalem, and rule the world. That's what many people wanted. They wanted a political, military leader that would overthrow Rome and, and, and subjugate all the nations under Israel. Interesting. So as we come to this, I want to share with you a quote. Someone once put it this way. By the time Matthew writes these same verses as Jesus arrives on the scene, Matthew, by the time he writes it, the people were no longer walking in darkness. They were sitting in darkness. They had practically given up. It was so bad that they had practically just given in and given up to the darkness. Oh, well, this is just the way it is. Nothing we can do about it. This is just the world. You better just get along to get along. It's interesting that they were literally sitting in darkness. There was so much despair by the time that Jesus arrived, they didn't even recognize him. They didn't even recognize the promises that the Messiah would come and what he would do. In fact, even at one point, they said, check your Bible. No one, no prophet comes from Galilee. No prophet comes from Nazareth. That's ironic because the Bible did, in fact, predict that Jesus would come from here. It's fascinating. So Jesus was growing up in Nazareth. So when we get to this reality of darkness, I want to share with you. I'm not going to put it on the screen. I just want you to hear these words. These are the words that came just before our passage of Scripture, talking about the cloud of darkness hanging over. Listen to this. This is very, very interesting. Distressed and hungry, they will roam through the land. When they are famished, they will become enraged. And looking upward will curse their king and their God. In other words, when really deep darkness and despair comes upon them, when they begin to reap what they have sown in their life by disobeying God, they actually have the audacity to shake their fists at God now because it's His fault that we're in darkness. It's His fault He can fix all of our problems. Never mind the problems in our own heart as we reject Him, but God can step in and fix this problem. Well, they go on, they realize that's not going to get them anywhere. Verse 22, then they will look towards earth and see only distress and darkness and fearful gloom. They'll look to God. He's not solving it. He's not stopping it. He could stop it, surely. If he's not going to stop it, we'll look to ourselves. Maybe we can save ourselves. Maybe we can deal with the darkness our own. When reality sets in and they realize that's not going to work either, that's when the real gloom and darkness creeps in. When you get a sense of hopelessness, when you get a sense that you just can't stop the darkness from encroaching on our land. It's interesting how it goes on to say, and they will be thrust into utter darkness. Whoa, these are the words of God. And, and there's one of the most preeminent prophets predicting all of this. Isaiah, he's a credible voice. It's one thing for someone to stand on a street corner and say, you know, repent, doom is coming upon you and your family, do something fast, boo, you know. It's one thing to hear that. It's another thing to hear from a credible, credible voice, a powerful voice that represents God, darkness ahead. Whoa. 
And we come to this passage and we go, whoa, 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 okay. Darkness is symbolic. We understand this, right? The Bible uses over and over again the contrast between light and darkness. And when it talks about darkness, it's not just talking about the darkness of judgment coming upon people who reject God. That's one thing. It's talking about the darkness of sin in the human heart. It's talking about literally the darkness that is immorality, the darkness that is violence, the darkness that is spiritual blindness. There is none more blind than he who will not see, right? As someone once said. So darkness is very, very meaningful, and it's meaningful to us. What dispels darkness? What dispels it? What stops it? I know as believers, we already have an idea. But you look at the world and throughout human history, you realize they've had some answers. They've had a lot of answers that were attempts to dispel darkness. What stops the encroachment? What was Rome feeling when it rose to its heights and when only violence and political corruption and sexual immorality was so prevalent, so rampant, that it destroyed the entire nation? They saw it coming. The writers of the early church fathers saw what was happening. What happens when you reject God? What happens when you turn your back on the instructions of God and choose to live any way you want to live? What happens is darkness is increased. What happens is darkness is amplified. What a strange concept. And so we realize that darkness encroaches even on our land today. And as we look at it, we look at what this country once was and we see the direction it's going. We we just, how did we get here? How did we get here where violence is celebrated? How do we get here where sexual immorality is so rampant We don't even know how to define it anymore. How did we get here? How do we get here when violence is celebrated in television and movies as if it's something to laugh at? How did we get here? And then when we see these actions happening in the real world, we say, how did this happen? How did we leap from entertainment to action? How are there evil forces in the world creeping over our land and what can we do about it? Well, I think it's very educational and informative to look at the ways that humanity has tried to answer the issue of darkness. Well, let's look at this, take a brief tour, okay? The Greeks pursued logic. The Greeks pursued the mind. And they thought that education would then be the answer, that education equals virtue. If you just educate someone between right and wrong, they'll do right. Right? As long as your children know what's wrong, they'll always do the right thing. Right? We can already see the weakness in the Greek thought, yet Western civilization, that includes us, has adopted that concept. And so the Greeks had that idea, and by the way, education is a wonderful thing, but does it really dispel darkness? The Jews lifted up politics. This is fascinating. From very early days, they demanded a king like all the other nations. We want a king, and God says, you don't know what you're asking for. They're going to rule over you. They're going to oppress you. They're going to take your money like most politicians. And so the Jews believed that politics was the answer, that leadership was the virtue, right? If you get the right person in power, the right person in office, why? They're just going to change the whole country, right? And so the Romans, the Romans, they just use a little bit of everything. The Romans says, yeah, Greeks, we're going to adopt your concept of education equals character. We like that. And, and, and by the way, po- politics are really important. We've developed this amazing concept of the Senate. And we have the emperor and we have all these things. Pretty close to what we have in America today. You know, they adopted all these strange, interesting ideas of politics. But what they really clung to was wealth and power. You will either conquer darkness by force or you'll buy it out. Wealth or power. So those are just three governments of all the histories of our world that have adopted a certain concept of how do you stop darkness from defeating our civilization? Their answers fell woefully short, didn't they? Rome ceased to exist as we once knew it. We know that the Greeks' concept did not last very long, though their writings and education system did. And we know that Israel was ultimately defeated, only to be brought back by God's mercy and not by their cleverness. And so let's unpack it to our land. Don't, uh, a little word of caution, don't think I'm reading politics into this. I'm just demonstrating something, okay? Take it easy. No hate mail. So humanity has tried to answer the problem of darkness in a lot of ways, even in our land. What are some of those? Well, first of all, the belief that education equals character. The belief that education equals values. Or, to put it another way, a lack of education means a lack of character. That's what our country has bought into. Education is immensely important. Education is an excellent tool. But education doesn't deal with the darkness of the human soul. Sorry. 
It's the idea that you think that only dumb people are criminals, right? Only uneducated people are criminals, right? Actually, it's fascinating. We educate the criminal heart, and by the time he's done with all his education, he's very clever at being a criminal. He becomes a better criminal, right? So the idea that education equals character misses an important aspect of the human soul. Well, here's another way we've attempted. That lack of money means corruption. Lack of money equals lack of character. Okay, well, if we just provide them money, provide them resources, deal with poverty by providing the answers, then they will not engage in crime. We've come to the realization that that's not true. That a criminal can still commit crimes whether he's poor or whether he's rich. In fact, some of the most clever criminals are very wealthy people, very smart people, and they steal a lot. And often from the very poor people. And we also find that oftentimes the poor people are not the ones committing the crimes because they're poor. They're committing the crimes because they would like some more drugs for their next drug fix. Or any number of a thousand issues. Did you know even a poor person can be greedy? So the concept that a lack of money or a lack of resources means a lack of, of uh, character is offensive. Because now you're saying poor people are incapable of having character? Really? Blessed are the poor because they're corrupt? No. And so we realize some of the other ways that they have attempted is the lack of leadership issue equals lack of character. If you don't have strong leadership, correct leadership, then the whole country has no excuse but to be corrupt themselves. Strange. So the concept is if I can just get the right person in Congress, if I can just get the right person in the Senate, if I can just get the right person in the presidential office, then the whole country will return to Jesus. I would love for that to be true, but history has proven it is not. Listen, good leadership is very, very helpful, but I don't know if you're like me, incredibly discouraged, when I had voted in some time back a certain group of people, and they had both the House and they had the Senate, and they turned out to be more corrupt than those I voted against. That's when I stopped caring. You see, apathy sets in. And so the idea is that we can just get the right person, if we can just get smart people, you know, smart people, and they'll tell us stupid people how we're supposed to live. You know what I'm talking about. If we can just elect to leadership the most brilliant, awesome academic elites, they can tell us how many ounces of soda we're really supposed to drink because we're too stupid to take care of ourselves. They can tell us how much salt, and they'll regulate for us how much salt we can have. I'm sorry, sir, you can only have one piece of bacon once a week. Move on. Step away. Your government has spoken. The idea that they'll just tell us which happy meals are appropriate for us, which restaurants we can eat at. And it goes on, what light bulbs can we actually use? No, we need to import light bulbs from China that have poison in it. Yeah, that's going to save the environment. It might save the environment, but it's likely to kill us. So it's interesting, that's one idea of dispelling darkness. Just put the right leader in play and he can tell us how to live. No, that's not the answer either. And so as we realize, we unpack these, one concept is a lack of laws equal a lack of character. A lack of, we just don't have enough laws to help properly regulate our society. If we have more laws, things would be better. For example, gosh, if we as a society can just get together, and if we can outlaw violence, just think of what a beautiful world this would be. Wait a minute, we did outlaw violence, didn't we? And it has not changed the human heart. My comments are not intended to be political. They're intended to be common sense. No matter what side of the aisle politically you come from, I think we can all agree the answer to the human heart is not found in any of those methods, right? You see, if your concept of Christmas is very shallow, if your concept of Christmas is but a holiday that comes once a year, then you are sitting in darkness because you've missed the most important answer that God has given humanity. Ah, but let us stay in darkness for a few more moments. I have not, I'm not ready to leave the topic just yet. Let's go to another aspect of darkness. Notice in our text it talks about those who live in the shadow, the land of the shadow of death, or I might say living under the shadow of death. The Greek translation puts it fascinating a little differently. I like it. The Septuagint and other Greek translations of the Old Testament. Listen to the way it puts it. I'm translating to English, of course. A land where death casts its shadow. Ooh. Living under the fear and finality of death, which casts its shadow over us all. 
So we have the darkness that is immorality and that is violence. We have the darkness that is sin within society. The darkness that turns human beings in the wrong direction. And then we have this other thing hanging over us. The shadow of death. The shadow of death is not just the fact that we're going to die someday. It's also the fact that someone may take our life today by violence. As we've seen in the news recently. Our society is living under the shadow of death. And this shadow casts itself over all of us. And then we come to one of the most stark realities that we cannot save ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. No, matter, no, no number of laws are going to change sin in the human heart. No matter of education will actually educate sin out of a human being. That doesn't work, does it? So as we come to this reality, we realize we can't even present ourselves from fading as human creatures. As live beings, we are given life. And day by day, here's a cheerful thought, day by day we lose it. We lose a little of our life each day, each day, until we look at ourselves in the mirror and we go, I wonder how much life I have left. You see, it's by God's design that this shadow is to remind us that there is a light. And that is not the answer of finality over a human being. But we live as if it is. We live with the shadow that hangs over us. We can't make ourselves stay alive, as one of the psalmists says. People who can't keep themselves from dying. Oh, we can try real hard with our vitamins, and I'm sure vitamins are great, and our exercise, I've heard it's pretty good for you. <laughs> but to try as hard as we can, we only seem to delay the inevitable. The loss of life is inevitable. And so one translation says this shadow that's hanging over us, this shadow of death that hangs over each and every one of us, one translation says, living in the land where darkness is most dense. See, the problem with the fear of death is it robs you of life. The problem with the fear of death is that it leads you in the wrong direction. The problem with the fear of death is that it casts a shadow over you as if this is all there is. You know, the Apostle Paul once said, if we're living and this is all there is, we are to be some of the most pitied people on the planet. This is not much to cling to for existence, is it? Now imagine the darkness and despair if your worldview is this is all there is. And think how horrifying it would be if someone by violence then took your life as an unbeliever. They didn't just take this life. They took everything you think exists. Oh, what darkness. Ah, and then we come to the message of Christmas. You see, the message of Christmas is not prepared to even be heard until you know about darkness and you know about death. The message of Christmas doesn't even have its full weight until you know the problems of human society, till you know what impacts our soul. Now we are prepared to hear the message of Christmas. You see, the message of Christmas acknowledges that we live in a very dark world. The message of Christmas acknowledges that human beings have a shadow of death hanging over them. We are born with a death sentence. That's the message of Christmas. Thank God it doesn't stop there, right? The message of Christmas goes on in a fascinating way. And in our passage today, I don't know if you caught it, the message of Christmas is right there. You see, he talks about doom and fear and despair. And then, with one word, Isaiah writes hope across all human history. With one word, he springs forth hope for all of us. What's this word? Oh, what a simple transition word. He talks about despair. He talks about doom. He talks about dread. Then he says, nevertheless, you're all going to die or so it seems, but nevertheless, what is this nevertheless? Well, tell me more about this nevertheless because the darkness and the dread and the death, that looks pretty deep. Nevertheless, there is hope because the Christ of Christmas was born. There is hope because the message of Christmas is the light is stronger than the darkness. There is hope because the message of the Christmas tells us that God has the answer for what causes us to struggle in this world. Isn't it interesting how in our society this answer is suppressed or people are offended by it? I don't know if you caught this. The, the government representative in New Jersey on the city council quits because they've added the word Christmas to Christmas tree lighting ceremony. Did you catch this one? Fascinating. 
She quit because she's offended by the concept that we would exclude all human beings from coming from a Christmas tree lighting by making it only a Christian tree lighting. Now this is very fascinating to me because it's a Christmas tree! What do you want to call it? It's a Christmas tree. I respect your right to refuse Christianity because God has given you that right. I respect it. I don't insist that everybody says Merry Christmas. They don't have to. In fact, I don't want you to say Merry Christmas if you don't believe in Jesus Christ because you don't even understand its full meaning. You don't even know what you're saying. You might as well be saying Festivus or Happy Hanukkah or any of the other holidays that exist. Wonderful holidays, but they're not Christmas. You see, Christ is the reason for Christmas. So don't get sucked into the culture wars. They're a waste of time. You are not going to convince anyone by force. So this person leaves because it says Christmas tree lighting. And I don't know if you caught the front page of the New York Daily News or the front page of the New York Times or any of the other newspapers out there. They're really railing against the concept of prayer and God. Why? What is it about the message of Christianity? Hope for all of humanity? Goodwill to all people? What is the message about peace on earth? How is this message offensive to people is what I want to know. The New York Daily News wants you to stop praying because praying is not going to bring anyone back to life, they say. What they don't realize is there are people who are alive who are yet dead. And if they die in that state, they will be eternally dead. So yes, we need to pray. We need to pray that people's eyes would be open, that the spiritual blindness would be lifted so they can see the face of the Christ of Christmas who has come into this dark world. You see, the message of Christmas is not that God sat back on a cloud somewhere and said, let's see how they save themselves. Let's see how they handle this darkness or that darkness. No. The message of Christmas is Jesus Christ entered into our dark world. That is, Jesus Christ has intervened into the world. God has not left us to sit in darkness. God has not left us to face darkness in this world all by ourselves. God has not left us to sit around and hope there's an answer. I don't know if you catch this a lot. A lot of people are saying, God help us. God help us. God help us. God has helped us. God has helped us through Jesus Christ. You say, how is that any help? Some guy dies 2,000 years ago and you expect that to be help? Oh, you need to come to our Christmas series and sit around for a while. Because rather than sitting in darkness, you're going to start seeing the light. Jesus Christ died on the cross so that death does not have to defeat you. Jesus died in Christ so you don't you died on the cross so you don't even have to live in the fear of death anymore. You can know with certainty what happens when you take your last breath. Oh, and by the way, it's not just Christianity and Christmas is not just for when you take your last breath, it's for the here and the now. You want to know what real love is? Look on the face of Jesus Christ. You want to know what real compassion is and mercy on your fellow man? You don't need to pass laws for that. Look to the face of Jesus Christ. You want to know the message of Christmas? It's the message that humanity needs God. It's the message that God loves humanity and has not left us to sit in darkness. Now, the message of Christmas is far more than a seasonal holiday. And for those of us who get it, oh, Merry Christmas means a whole new thing, doesn't it? Merry Christmas, church. We have the light of the world. Who is that person? Listen to the words of Jesus Christ. For a profound statement from a man who's either delusional and crazy, or he is Lord and Master. John chapter 8, verse 12. Listen to this. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, and I quote, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The light of life that never stops. Listen to how John writes it in his gospel. You've heard these words before, but let it sink in now in light of the Christmas light that is Jesus. John 1, verses 4 and 5. In Jesus, in Him, was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Another translation? The darkness has not overcome it. The darkness cannot extinguish it. The darkness cannot stop the light of Jesus Christ from shining. Nothing can. You see, we think of darkness as a substance. It's not. It's not. You see, darkness flees from light. Light. The light of the world is found in the face of Jesus Christ, and no darkness can prevail against it. And as we go through this series together, we will look deeper week by week until Christmas is upon us. So until then... Merry Christmas.
Would you stand up? Don't get caught up in the culture wars. wars. Who cares whether a coffee cup says Merry Christmas or not? It's irrelevant. <laughs> Who cares? I mean, listen, if we were going to stop shopping in this world because people didn't do things we liked, right? They didn't say Christmas or Jesus, or they started calling their Christmas trees like Target did, the holiday trees. If we stop shopping at all of these stores that dishonor Christ in our name, you're going to have to do your grocery shopping, Christmas shopping, and everything else out of 7-Eleven. So if you really want to be so holy as to go that route, knock yourself out. Pick me up a Slurpee for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I lost track. All I know is I'm excited. Anyone know how many Fridays till Christmas? Three. Three. Woo! Come on. This is getting close. It's getting close. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open up your word. Thank you for being, to remind us that you are the light of the world. Our government's not the light of the world. A document's not the light of the world. A, a particular leader is not the light of the world. You are. You are the one who said, if we follow you, we'll never walk in darkness. So Lord, may our voices lift up not to fight against those who don't want to say your name. May our voices be lifted up to praise your name. Lord, I'm reminded of your word that says, may the words of my mouth, may the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We love you, Jesus. Amplify your light into our hearts so that our hearts would shine your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.